My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. So when you've installed this with clients, what like what have they what have they gained from doing this? I mean, aside from it, there sounds like there's some obvious uh, air quality uh, uh, um, improvements to be made. Um, things could happen a lot faster. Sounds like like you're trimming away on that time cycle uh, delays. Yeah. So it's actually it's uh, it's really interesting. So one of the things that we notice a lot of times the first time someone gets into 360 is you'll identify a whole bunch of problems in your operation that are all of a sudden become obvious. Mm. Um, so we've seen anything from, you know, uh, large dollar figures worth of data entry errors um, that were missed in a given place or, you know, one meter that's throwing a whole plant out of balance, but you don't know which one it is um, to, uh, you know, People, kind of more mundane things like you have an operator who's spending a lot of time looking at this particular producer when they basically never give you a problem. Whereas yeah, this other producer yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. you test once yeah. a month but is always a problem. Um, so, uh, and then the, the other thing, so that's kind of on, on, the, on, on the measurement side. The other thing we've seen on the operational side, which really leads to how we started developing uh, Validator Alpha, is that all of a sudden you have this really obvious picture of everything that's coming into your facility and everything that's leaving your facility. And you can start to ask questions about, you know, optimization and, mm. and market dynamics. And, you know, did I actually do the thing that makes the most sense with this barrel? Um, mm. And that can be down to the, you know, the mundane, uh, kind of the more mundane detail. Let's say, you know, I'm at Cushing and I'm doing a, uh, uh, a sulfur blend, Right. Uh, and I have my uncertainty in, uh, you know, in the accuracy of the measurement and the time scale is, you know, 0.04, let's say, uh, percent, but I'm always blending 0.1% under my limit, right? That's a, uh, a fairly straightforward reconciliation of, you know, if you really understood your measurement data, you probably would be uh, blending closer to the limit. Um, but then you can also have uh, more complex things where you can ask, um, you know, actually maybe here's one of, the, one of the coolest examples we've seen is uh, you know a facility that is is uh, taking a lot of barrels in on trucks. Um, oftentimes, you have a quality target that you have to hit that's ultimately appraised on a monthly composite, but you have to hit a certain spec on a daily basis, and so then you end up making da- daily decisions which are effectively based on your best prediction as what's going to come in tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the yeah, next day, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, and so so if you're progressively further away from your target. Further out, you, yeah. you'd, you'd have tighter tolerances now, yeah. Right? yeah, so that you've you've got some you've built up some some capacity to deal with the variances down the road. But once you have that data consolidated, you can start to ask those questions really easily. So precisely, yeah, and then you could. But your look back actually gets a lot more powerful because yeah. now you can actually see well what actually did real what happened, and yeah. then over time you can learn better, right? Yeah. Certain producers have certain you know quality, quality differences that they you know yeah. And speaking of lookback, that's actually the other thing that uh, we've noticed with 360 that's been an interesting sales channel for us is that um, one of the things we wanted to do with the visualization was to make the audit trails a lot easier so that we took a lot of the effort away from these disputes yeah. um, so that it would be very easy. You compare your data to my data. We can get to the bottom of which is the problem meter and, and put the whole issue to bed. Um, and so what's actually been interesting is that we have made a number of client acquisitions where basically – Somebody using our software sent a report generated by our software to enforce another client, another company, and then that company came to us <laughs> and said, "Hey, what's this what's tool we just got enforced on?" You know, exactly. it's uh, <laughs> please explain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can we buy this? Uh, we take a dispute away. <laughs> so, uh, so, and that's you know, in terms of our overall sales strategy, we started with gathering systems because we figured that whoever takes the most volumes in the smallest increments is going to be the one that has the hardest time keeping track of yeah, quality in the exactly. field. Yep, and gathering systems would be it. And then we've basically organically gone upstream and downstream from there. From there, right? Um, so who are the bigger customers now? Not not naming names, but are you really aiming at um, midstream uh, position, midstream operators, or is it, uh, or is there is there not much of a pattern at this stage? So we have actually had. So interestingly, we started with midstream and producers, um, and our thought was that refiners really are on top of their quality. Um, 
but uh, you know their biggest complaint is the producers aren't. <laughs> Um, and uh, and the interesting thing is that we've actually had the majority of our cold inbound uh, leads have been refiners, and that's probably mostly, mostly because we're not spamming them with warm um, <laughs> with our own intros. But uh, but so the the upshot is we we've we've been able to get penetration really all the way across the supply chain. And I'd say the biggest pattern that we've seen is not so much which clients which segment of the market takes us as clients. It's more the order in which they start using our solutions. So it's been fairly common for producers that have, you know, more simple qualities, but very lean marketing teams Mm -hmm. to start with alpha and work their way down. Um, And then really only bring in 360 once they understand the commercial importance of some of these smaller decisions. And they understand actually which of their facilities you actually need 360. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them you might not. Yeah. Exactly. Your hotspots. Yeah. Whereas with midstream, it's almost always been 360 up and, and, uh, The reason for that is really twofold. One, the operations are very complex and there's lots of data flowing around. And so there's really um, an urgent need there. But then the second thing is that um, in terms of the value on the marketing side, the, the, the value on the marketing side for alpha gets really powerful once you've done the work to build that source of truth across mm. your system, mm. which is for producers a little bit more trivial for a simple operation, right? You might have only a handful of well tests. Maybe you've got one meter. It's uh, mm. there's not much to do. So that's that's I think it's been has been the biggest pattern is that generally for producers it's alpha down and for for midstream it's three sixty up. And w- at what point does the uh, if you could say the, the the scale of operations triggers um, interest? Is it do you see it on a per barrel basis or is it on throughput? Is it on uh, total wells under management? Say for in the, in the upstream, like once you're uh, I'm curious to know at what point does someone conclude this is going to economically really help me out? So you know what's interesting. So we found. Um, so far with the clients we have. And I, I suspect there's going to be, we'll find some exceptions. But there's this interesting, almost inverse correlation with the percentage of uh, net back uplift you can get and the number of barrels you produce, um, whereby uh, it's like our value proposition evolves the smaller you get and gets bigger. As a result, you can afford us the smaller you are. And so I would say generally... Um, <laughs> that, that is counterintuitive. It is counterintuitive. That normally work this way. So uh, I would say that uh, for midstream, for midstream, it is more common that we get into a little bit bigger companies first. Whereas for producers, the trend is almost the other way around. Small company. Um, yeah. And uh, it, may, it may be that the marginal net back is just economically more material as a small company, like anything. Plus, they have fewer things to change to be able to adopt. I think it's also a personnel thing. I think that, uh, you know, there's a producer, once you get below a certain number of barrels, and I'm going to ballpark that at maybe 20,000, mm-hmm. it starts to not make sense to have your own marketing team or your own quality team. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so then the use case becomes very straightforward. And the way that we've typically worked with producers in the 360 side, we actually we made it a, a, a different brand name for, if you want to call it Valor 360 Pro, which is basically outsourced quality management. And the only difference is that instead of giving you recommendations as to what workflows to enter in the system, we enter the workflows we call the lab companies. Uh, right. We sometimes have even bought instruments and rented them out to, or rented to buy them to producers because they don't have anyone to evaluate. To take the role on, right? Yeah, exactly. Too small. Um, huh. and, uh, and that's, you know, the interesting thing from a sales cycle perspective for us, you look at the alpha side, it's kind of the same thing. We have powerful tools that help um, augment marketing teams. But if you don't have a marketing team, then it's it becomes very easy to uh, to understand how you're going to use that tool. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so the sales cycle yeah. gets a lot shorter. So it's really short, yeah. So uh, changing people's jobs, there's process doesn't exactly change exactly. Change yeah, there's an old Chinese saying. I think change is easy except for the people. So if you have a technology that solves a problem that doesn't involve you having to change people's jobs, roles, organization, process, so uh, easier adoption. I actually I have a little bit of different thought about this, and it actually, it's I think it's one of the it's one of the more fundamental. Um, well, it's not quite different. It's, it's a little bit different. You'll see, you you be the judge. Um, 
it, it maybe has less of a less of a, I think it has less of a judgmental connotation on the people, mm-hmm. um, the way I, I conceptualize it. But I think it's, it, it, I like to bring it up because I think it's one of the most important kind of philosophies that underlie everything that we do at Valier. So so I have a if there was anybody if if, if I think the closest thing I could say to what if you asked me what my life philosophy would be, it would be, I believe in the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and what I mean by that, so here's how I conceptualize that this is the, my layman's version of second law of thermodynamics, yep. Yep. is that it takes an extreme amount of energy to configure many bodies in an arrangement that is extremely unlikely to happen by chance. Um, and my, that, th- my thousand painters to paint my house, right? Exactly, and that applies to people. To get that lined up. Yeah, so, totally. so, um, so you'll see that you know in kind of mundane ways and sales cycles, right? You sell quicker to smaller companies because there's fewer people that have to make decisions. And, yeah. Um, but, uh, but it also, I think, is a fundamental ramifications for how you think about AI in the oil industry in general, right? So, if you think about, I also know AI is all about improving decision making. Decision making really has three parts, right? There is data gathering. There is making the decision based on the data, and then there's actually implementing the decision. Um, And if you look at almost all of the industries where AI has really had a transformational effect to date, it's been areas where step three has been trivial or automatable, right? So driverless car, there's lots of research that's gone into it. It's a very hard problem to figure out whether a car needs to change lanes or not in response to a given you know, right. visual input. Right. But it's a very easy problem to actually turn the car once you've decided once that the car to change lanes. Quite right. yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas I think in this industry, the, the companies that are going to succeed from an uh, AI perspective are the ones that are going to recognize that actually step three is just as hard as step two. And you have to engineer... Um, for step three, making it easy to execute on insights is as important as coming up with good insights. And so that's actually, when we look at our KPIs for client success, that's one of the things that we track mm-hmm. is, you know, we'll say here is the, it's almost like our own version of the paper blend against the re- real blend, right? It's like the paper blend is here's the value of all the insights we've given you, but then what percentage of the time were they actually followed through on? And we don't assume that because they didn't get followed through on that it's Oh, it's the industry's fault. You know, they're just yeah. so slow and laggers yeah. and yeah. whatever. Um, no, but, yeah, it's just hard to do. Yeah, to it's actually it's you hard know, to execute. if you want to move a thousand cubes of, of crude, it takes something like forty trucks. Well, like that's, you th- yeah, well, the the, the, uh, the the example I'm watching now with some interest is this uh, this uh, organic uh, problem in Russia. Right, these are pipelines. Two mil- millions and millions of barrels are contaminated, and you just start to do the math and go, well, how are you going to blend that? Like, where are you going to find a blending facility yeah. big enough to take? What yeah. is, you know, say 10 million barrels and go, I'm going to, I'm going to now blend that down to, you know, from, from, I don't know what the number, or what the numbers are, four parts per billion to one part per billion. Well, I need, I need to, I need four times the volume of my contaminated product to get the blend right. Yeah. Yeah. How, how on earth are you going to do that? It's, yeah. it's a very easy decision, very hard to make. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so this is really it's top to bottom on yeah. how we've designed our solutions we have this in mind, which is always how do you, I call it friction, basically, how do you reduce friction, right? So we have, I can give you a bunch of Another examples. thermodynamic law, by the way. Yeah. So, so uh, and I can give you some examples of things we've done in our solutions from the mundane to the, you know, more fundamental um, that are all built around this thing that are maybe different from how you would think about building a typical software product, yeah. Yeah. right? So the first thing, um, you know, on the 360 side, we made the decision that uh, we wanted to collect this data in the way, not in the way that was theoretically best, but in the way that was going to be the least pain to your organization to implement. So that meant that we had to build a lot of, you know, one-off scrapers and data converters yep, and yep. whatever to plug into whatever old systems you had. Um, for some tests, like the centrifuge test, which is fundamentally manual, we actually built a scanner for centrifuge tubes. That's one of the two times we've gotten into the hardware business. Um, and... Uh, and and then for you know when when um, we you know actually to get the connectivity to bring that stuff up to the cloud, our assumption is if you have a system there you want us to plug into, we'll do that. But we're happy to bring that in too. So typically for field labs and when you have the analyzers going around in trucks, mm-hmm. we have our own IoT nodes that you put in the back of the instrument that plug up through the cell towers and have everything go. Um, and uh, you know another thing that's kind of built into all that is. 
no data entry. Basically, anytime someone has to do data entry, you're causing a lot of uh, you're causing a lot of headaches. You're going to create a lot of errors, and you're you're making it less likely that data is going to actually get entered. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've again down to probably the scanner for centrifuge tube is the most extreme example where yeah. we have yeah. you know built something to avoid data entry. Yeah, but it's an important point. Uh, one of the challenges of a lot of digital innovations in oil and gas is the failure to think through all the way to the end. How exactly yeah. is this going to plug into an existing yeah. running business? How did yeah. you do that? Did you actually, uh, it was a trial and error as you worked your way through it, or did you set up a design studio somewhere where you, say, put a uh, put a, a, a mocked-up oil company inside and said, how can we, how do we solve this? So a little bit of both. I'd say mostly trial and error. So one of the things that we did when we first raised money was we, and we actually, we don't have it anymore, but we originally, we built our own lab. Um, and, uh, it was a fairly standard oil lab. It looked very much similar to a lot of our customers labs. Um, and it allowed us to, you know, work through these workflows and think about how these things work, get ahead and play around the instruments, whatever. Um, but, uh, but a lot of the stuff, probably the, really the majority of the stuff has been more trial and error in the field. Um, and I think just the ability to adapt quickly is something that, you know, with customers, with customers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're bringing an agile way of, you know, do something trial. If yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. So, so there's a great debate in oil and gas about whether or not agile can actually work and what what your experience is, at least with the development of your your uh, uh, solution. Uh, agile was a key way that you, you drove it. So you know what I actually think is really interesting? Um, it's been kind of a, 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 a tangential observation. Um, but so... You know, compared to some industries, right, if you look at, you know, um, mom and pop retail sellers that are looking for extra analytics, right, there is no question that they are going to have to get this from a third party, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody who's selling a couple hundred thousand dollars of shoes a year is going to be able to afford it, right? right? But uh, if you look at a lot of uh, oil companies, you're big enough that, to me, to build or to buy is not clearly obvious one way or the other. I think there are trade-offs, right? Uh, there, are, there are costs and benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and and that's not to say, by the way, you should always build. I think, I think there, there's a, lo- a lot of benefits to buy, but there are some areas where, where I, I mean, I think, I think building can work too. But the thing that, that surprises me more is the way that companies, you see a lot of companies where it's like you'll have a few meetings and it's almost a coin flip as to whether they're going to build or buy. But then once they decide to build or buy, the way they go about it is completely different which is really weird, right? So, so generally, when you are buying, you're always buying from the edge in, right? So you're usually, the, the business units that are going to be using the tools are the ones that are going out to find the vendors. They're, you know, um, they, they experimenting the at the edge. They have the use case. And then yeah. the, you know, the centralized, you're going to have a centralized uh, IT team that has to figure out how to stitch all this stuff together in a way that's rational. Um, but, uh, but that happens almost as a second, uh, a second process. Yeah. Whereas when, um, when companies decide to build, oftentimes you see that go the other way. Uh, and oftentimes that works less well. Where it's, it's because you've decided to build, there is this inherent push to centralize the whole effort, but then you lose, everybody at the, the edge has lost the ability to be agile and experiment. Yeah. Um, and so the advice I always have, I mean, obviously I guess I'm biased to say, hey, you know, you should really think about buying for a third party. Um, but, uh, you know, reality, there's sometimes you should build, sometimes you should buy, and there's sometimes where it's really not clear, or it might be a coin flip. But uh, definitely the advice I give is that when you build something yourself, you should really treat, um, I always think it's like treat your own IT team as if it were an external vendor. And then, Inherently, you the, you go to the edge. You go to yeah. the edge, yeah. The edge, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a way to make it work. And you gotta, you gotta, some IT teams will really struggle with that because that's just not how they're that's not how they're wired. Uh, but you know what? There's and again, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, not there. There are there are also IT teams that 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 get this. Oh yeah, um, or I certainly want to get it because yeah. you know the next generation of. You know, talent coming into those organizations are used to doing it this way. So they, they, you know, and they you know, run headlong into well, the old-fashioned way of doing these sorts of yeah. things, and then struggle with it. So, speaking of talent, I think talent is actually one. That's probably one of the better arguments to buy, and it is one. You know, one area that I think that uh, has been, you know, something that we really focus on. That I, I, I think, and I hope is going to be a long-term competitive advantage for us. But I think. One thing that a service provider like us can really do 
is effectively play an Arbonne talent that we can leverage for our customers, right? And it's actually one of the reasons, I mean, why, you know, we have uh, built a geographically distributed team from day one, which is like, you know, how can I, you know, you have you kind of, kind of this, 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 this um, interesting problem, which is both kind of a function of geography, um, you know, a lot, not a lot of the best tech schools are in oil towns, but it's also a lot of this, there's some, you know, this, this, uh, this PR stuff, which is like, you know, kind of ironically, um, and this is an oil thing, but it's like, you know, the smartest people that come out of CS degrees would rather make, you know, disappearing cat video products than, you know, deal with the fuel that powers our life. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, it's but that is, the, but that is, the, that is the reality. Right. Um, and, uh, and so what's, um, you know, what's been interesting for us and what's worked for us is that we realized from an early day that we were going to build a geographically distributed team. This is better than the talent costs uh, of of making a sacrifice on either way, whether we built up completely in Calgary or Houston or we built up completely in Toronto or San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so the interesting uh, the interesting thing that, that that we're able to do then is really you know, marry the industry expertise from people that have really lived it with um, some of the best tech talent that you can get, you know, that uh, will give all those spillover effects from Amazon or wherever they yeah, just work, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then, but you have interesting things on, 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 from a communication standpoint too. One of the things that I think has naturally happened w- within our company, which is kind of cool, is, you know, we kind of become a microcosm for the conversations that, I hope happen more often publicly in Canada, right? Where you have, you know, Quebecers and Torontonians talking to Albertans and having a real conversation <laughs> about, you know, what energy is and what it isn't and what the real trade-offs are and what they aren't. Yeah. Um, so it's happening at this, in a tech startup world, trying to solve it. Well, it's problem. happening within one company, yeah, right? We, we, we have a, uh, um, you know, we have a really, an interesting culture in that respect where we have, you know, a, a mix of people that, you know, really live the energy world and people that really kind of are energy neophytes and really live the tech world. That's a really interesting observation, too. If you think about it, most, most tech, most oil and gas companies, if they choose to you know, develop a, uh, a talent base for their business, uh, they will think that the, those resources need to be physically visible, present and living in Calgary, that no one outside of that is really qualified or competent to that. And, and what you're doing is what you're saying is you, you can put paid to that argument because you can tap a um, resource pool that is literally global uh, given today's day. It's also society. just the learning. It's, it's also just a learning thing, right? They turn over employees every two years, right? So you need like a thousand people come into the, one of these top-notch companies, or yeah. and then they get turned out and they start their own thing. It's one of the critical reasons for the all oh, why so many cities made such a play for Amazon is yeah. that they said the ecosystem of, and spinoff effects from having a company like that in yeah. your neighborhood are, are yeah. really really. Hard. But here's the other thing I would say about distributed teams, right? Which is mm-hmm. so. One thing that people don't appreciate, I think, enough in uh, innovation economies is how fat-tailed the returns on labor are, right? Which means that. Um, you know, for example, if you're looking for someone who's a field guy doing testing, you're not generally going to find someone who is 10 times more productive than their colleague. In fact, you'd be worried if they log 10 <laughs> times as many tasks as their, yeah. their colleague, yeah. right? Whereas in uh, in analytics, you absolutely can find, and in fact, it's, 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 it's very common to have your best performers be Five to times, five to ten times better than than the average uh, worker in that field, mm. um, and what that means, you know. So, for example, one thing that that it, it, there, there's from a hiring perspective, it's counterintuitive, right? That the, a lot of your your the advisors when you start a tech company will say, hey, you know, you want to find the person who's ten times better and pay them twice as much, right? And that's kind of counterintuitive. But you also say the same thing, right? Like if you look at myself, I probably you know, I'm flying somewhere at least three weeks in the month, right? I'm probably in Calgary at least two weeks of the month. Um, if you add the cost of my travel to my salary, mm-hmm. right, you're still not going to get up to the multiple. And I don't necessarily, let's not pick on me because then I'm, I'm making an implicit uh, statement about my own productivity. Correct. But let's say that, that value, uh, little values yeah, let's say, but, here, but here's, here's really where it matters, right? Let's say you're a company like, you know, a, a big oil company based in Calgary, and you're thinking about building an innovation team. I actually think you should consider building that team, you know, in Toronto or in San Francisco, um, and then, or, or make it semi-distributed, right, where you do something like tap, ours. Tap in and, states, and, and, yeah. and 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 the thought really is that mm. uh, if you add the cost of, you know, actually, I know a company that's doing this. They have a guy who commutes 
from Toronto every week. Um, and if you add that cost of commuting to the salary, um, you're still not going to get to a multiple of the salary that um, yeah. doesn't make sense for a 5X person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. quite right. Yeah. And also yeah. recognizing that a 5X person is not necessarily just an innate trait of the person. It also is a function of the fact that they have you know, zillions of people around them that uh, they can ask questions about AI yeah. or they can go to yeah. a laser meetup groups well, or whatnot. Exactly, yeah. Um, the network. yeah. Well, there was, a, there was an interesting uh, uh, client I worked with in Australia who... Um, uh, had operators that uh, carried out a circuit to visit uh, field assets on a sh- uh, daily basis. So they could go look at 10 wells and inspect them and so forth. And they substituted a, a drone overflight. So the drone would actually look at 150 wells where the, you know, had the operator just doing 10. And uh, the, so the productivity boost was huge, 15 times. By switching to the drone with one pilot, yeah. they would then um, drive effectively drive the drone over the gas wells and the, the drone was equipped with uh, before and after photography services, uh, LIDAR, moisture detection, damage detection, all kinds of things. Um, and the oil company got really hung up on this because they had to pay the pilot standard pilot wages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They completely missed the scale effect that they were getting. Yeah. They were getting a 15 yeah. times productivity boost. And the, the, the aeronautics company came to me to say, we're struggling to get our message across to the oil company. You're, you have to pay these pilots more than just a field tech driving around. Yeah. But the benefit of having them, um, the productivity gain was 15 times. So, you know, it's funny. It's actually, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll proudly, uh, I guess, do a shout out to a company that started by a friend of ours. It was in the same batch at Y Combinator. But uh, they're doing a similar thing with, with autonomous trucks. It's a really cool way to make autonomous trucks. They're called um, Starsky Robotics. But basically, what they do is exactly that, right? So, they've figured out that autonomous driving on the highway is um, is not that difficult compared to the last mile, first and last mile. Yeah, the highway um, is pretty straightforward. Yeah. And uh, so what what the what they what they're doing now, and it's it's actually live and commercial, at least in, in Florida, is this combination of teleoperation and autonomous highway driving, and you end up with this this uh, again scalability effect where let's say out of an average 500 mile distance, there's maybe three miles that you need a teleoperator for, which means one teleoperator can now drive 20 trucks. Yeah, um, yeah. same effect. And, are you going to pay them 20 times your truck driver, or are you going to insist that they be paid the same as a regular truck driver? Well, I mean, I don't pay truck drivers, so um, <laughs> it's... Yeah, but uh, but, it, but it's the, it is the challenge, right? So, well, here's the thing. I think that you... You know, in general, you find that these ARBs tend to work in companies' favors, right? Where usually you have somebody who's five times more productive, they get paid twice as much, except for some weird places where you have such a scarcity of people that are that qualified that you yeah. end up with yep. crazy salary yep. inflation, yep. right? Yep. But um, what I'd say is you certainly want to pay that person more than a normal trucker, right? Because if they screw up, it's going to be 15 times as bad. Yeah. Um, or yeah. if they're bad, it's going to yeah. be 15, 15 times, times as bad, worse. right? Yeah. So you want to yeah. make sure that you're getting kind of top 5% of all truckers out there. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, and that tends to be the pattern in lots of things, right? I think that in general, you want to, uh, you know, whether that's that's direct costs or it's implied costs for things like travel, whether it's, you know, in our case, the industry experts traveling to Toronto periodically, or it's the Toronto people traveling to Calgary or to Houston or to Oklahoma. Um, I think you are going to end up with costs that uh, cost per capita that are are and should be, frankly, higher than uh, what they would be before you really adopted some of these technologies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these these are all coming. I'm just imagining now with all of the highway traffic uh, going up to and from, say, Calgary, Red Deer, Edmonton to Fort Mac. Uh, the, this autonomous road activity is is going to come to this part of the world uh, sooner rather than later. I suspect. You know, it's interesting. I, I uh, other. Other hot button debates that you could you could get into on this. I think one of the things that will make actually, I think there are two things that are going to make Alberta one of the last places in the world to get widespread adoption of autonomous vehicles um, outside of uh, controlled environments like oil sands mines, where there actually already where are. Where they first, yeah, one yeah. of the first adopters. Um, I, and the two reasons are snow and internet connectivity. Um, and uh, if you look at, I mean, there's a reason why Arizona has been where. Uh, lots and lots of autonomous vehicle testing has been done. It's because yeah. basically there's never any clouds. You're never out of, you're never out of sight. Yeah. yeah. You're online and, all the time. Yeah, yeah and, and they're always done in big cities where you're online all the time. Uh, and, and the I weather, think, and the weather, right? Yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's, that was, my, that was yeah. the original reason why I picked yeah, Arizona, precisely. right? Yeah. Big cities. Dry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, 
So yeah, so I, I, I do think that uh, there are going to be some things, some technologies where Canada is going to be fairly, fairly late to the game in terms of availability. Um, and I would put autonomous vehicles pretty high on the list. Yeah, because of those phenomena. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Uh, this has been a, uh, a very interesting discussion. Uh, let me just close off with um, uh, just some examples. If you could share uh, what what uh, uh, benefits or gains companies have experienced when they uh, f- uh, tackle this uh, question of measurement uh, in a in a new and different way. Like what are, what are they what are they experiencing by way of upside? Sure. Yeah. So uh, there's generally two buckets of upside. Right. There's there's more net backs and less work together, right? Yeah, yeah. Less work is, you know, savings in operational costs, whether that's on mediating disputes or that's in, you know, that you have to have more field techs or, or, or more production accountants or whatever. Um, and the upside is basically the, how do you reap the fruits of making better decisions on quality, whether that's, you know, eliminating off spec events and shut-ins and stuff like that, or it's, yeah. you know, making better decisions on that path dependence of your value. Yeah. Uh, so, or, or, or in some instances, I suspect taking advantage of someone who's not nearly as good at this as you are, because you now have insight into their their particular issues. Well, you know let I mean? me say well, let me say it in a diplomatic way that validator <laughs> doesn't take winners, right. and we give everyone the tools to do the best they can, and they can right. use our tools however they want to. Quite, quite, um, quite, quite right. But in the world of oil and gas, if you knew that a specific player in the industry is chronically off spec. You could design your business model to take full advantage of that. Not you as the measurement company, but as another oil company. Yeah, I, and so there's I, there's there's two ways that you see that, right? Yeah. One is providing liquidity effectively. You're giving them a uh, you're giving them liquidity at exchange for a deep discount, which is basically a function of their own incompetence exactly. or quality. Yep. Um, the other one, which is maybe a little more esoteric, but less com, uh, but but uh, but potentially more common, is that you just don't work with those people, <laughs> <laughs> and then you save, you get higher net backs just because you get less upsets that have you know, or you've gotten chlorides exactly, yeah. in a small yeah. tank became chlorides yeah. in a big tank. Yeah. Um, so yeah. in terms of overall numbers, uh, I'd say you know two to three percent uh, net back increases are pretty typical. Um, I when we talked about converting to percent, I. I have to think a little bit of what the, the operational efficiency savings would account for in terms of percent of your total operations. Um, mm, yeah, it's probably not the principal driver. Yeah, um, but then I can tell you that we've uh, we've gotten as high as about twenty five percent in one case, yeah. um, and uh, and you know particularly uh, you know Canada, given that I guess this is a Canadian podcast, mm. Canada has some interesting macro trends that. Um, really make the percentage of your net backs or your bottom line that uh, quality underpins is going to become more and more important. Um, and uh, so, so there's, there's a number of reasons for that, right? One is generally more quality-based volatility in the market, right? So for example, if you look in October, November, December, um, you had the price of crude go to almost zero, but the price of condensate exactly, didn't, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you could have a barrel that could be very easily crude or condensate. Um, th- that kind of sits in between, right? Um, you uh, so that's the quality-based volatility. Um, the other one is that you have such incredibly diverse quality in a, such a tight geography, um, and that means that basically whether or not you're on top of it, a lot of stuff is going to happen to your barrel before it gets to market, <laughs> unless it's being refined locally, yeah. right? Or you make the decision, which some people are doing, to rail your neat barrel all the way down to the Gulf Coast so it yeah. doesn't get mingled with those barrels. Um, exactly right. And the third thing, which is uh, you know kind of relates to that, is that certain Canadian qualities are becoming more and more important globally with Iran sanctions and Venezuela going you know cuckoo, um, you uh, and this, this, you know, the proliferation of shale, which has tended to be a lighter barrel, and this, this global shortage of middle distillates. Mm. Um, you are, uh, you know, there's, there's an increasing, there, there, there's an increasing scarcity of certain types of barrels that you find fairly commonly in Canada. Um, and uh, of course, if that's the opportunity that you want to capture, then you also have to figure out how to. What's the pathway to market? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Find a path dependence that market? gives you that. Yeah quality at the other end yeah right on uh ian this has been uh, fantastic thanks so much for uh, taking the time uh to uh, spend with me appreciate this and uh good luck with uh validare in the market sounds good thanks a lot thanks for listening if you enjoyed this podcast be sure to subscribe to the show 
You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.